I have good friends, some, some people that I know here for a long time, and some other people that I know a little less, but I'm nevertheless, I'm glad to be with you. We already prayed. As we start, I don't want to uh, just go around with introductions. I want to go straight into the subject because uh, the subject is quite long, but I will try to make it short. Oh, it's going to be only three hours, don't worry. No, 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 it's not three hours. I want to, as we start, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Do you think that change is possible? Yes. Do you think that uh, people can basically get victory? This is a tough question because many times we theoretically say yes, but practically we struggle. I don't know what you struggle with. But for instance, let's suppose uh, you struggle with uh, patience, okay? And you say, I'm going to be patient, I'm going to be patient, and you pray for patience. And then somebody bothers you really bad, and you get red, and your blood goes really fast, but you keep patient. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to explode, you know, kind of. And eventually, when you are tired, you still explode. So you may be able to change your external behavior, but how do you change your heart? That's the key. I've heard people that say, I've been praying for this. I'm, I've been fighting it, and still, every once in a while, I fail. Paul the Apostle says, and remember, Paul didn't say this in the beginning of his ministry, but towards the end of his ministry. He says, I don't do what I want. I do what I hate. Who is going to deliver me from this body? The spirit of prophecy says that we may change our behavior, but we will never be able to change our human nature, our sinful tendencies. David says that we are born in sin. Paul says in Romans that all, how many? All have sinned. Nobody, nobody is perfect except God and the politicians. Nobody else. <laughs> and so... How do you acquire righteousness? I, uh, I'm not going to give you the name or the location. But many years ago, when I was in college, construction university, I used to go to a church in Romania that was quite a large church. And we had an old pastor. And the pastor was hardly breathing, like... <gasps> Kind of. And uh, in that time, I don't remember the number, so I cannot tell you precisely, but it was like the government approved only, let's say, two students in the seminary each year. But you'll have about 10, 15, maybe 20 pastors, I don't know how many, retiring, but you'll get only two new ones in. So after a while, we had less and less and less pastors. And uh, the elders would do most of the jobs in the churches. And that pastor was old, but pastors would not retire because there were no new pastors coming in. So pastors would stay until they were 80, 90, 150. I'm exaggerating to make a point. They would stay on the pulpit. And so that pastor was quite old. I'm not going to tell you the name, but some of you may know the name. And the youth at the balcony, there was a nice choir, a round balcony, and the youth there, some of them were doing pretty bad stuff on Sabbath during church. And some others in the church were sleeping because it would take the pastor 10 minutes to say one word, you know. And so in that time, my friend and I started to pray for the church. And he lived in a little, 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 little apartment room in an attic. And we would meet there and we would pray two days a week in the evening, I don't remember, it was Tuesday and I believe Friday night. For about half an hour, we would pray for the church. And then the girl that she was a student in the music conservatory, she played piano, she joined us praying for the church. And then another one joined us praying for the church. And then we started to pray at the church for the church. And then we had about 11 young people praying. After about three, four, five months, we had over 50 young people praying for the church. And then those young people started to not only pray, but get involved in the church. 
Visit the old, visit the sick, uh, do shopping, grocery shopping for people that could not do that for themselves, clean their homes. And we started to get involved programs. We started to study together. I remember patriarchs and prophets. And we would just talk about interesting points from people's lives, like Daniel, or that's not in Patriots, so about Joseph, about Moses, about, you know, Abraham, and so on. And so we started to get involved. And in that time, we also got a new pastor who used to play violin really nice. And he also was speaking very profound, very spiritual. And eventually, the church was revived and experienced uh, new life and growth. In that time, in that specific time, there were people on our prayer list. I don't remember how many, 10, 11, 12 people. And most of them, seven, eight of them, that we prayed for, that were not attending church, they came to church. In that time, a family, two parents came to me and said, you guys, you are praying for the church. You pray for that person, you prayed for that person, you pray for that person. Would you pray for our daughter? It happens that I knew that family for many years. And their daughter left the church. And not only that she left the church, she was doing pretty heavy stuff. And I'm not going to explain what, you know, or alcohol or smoking or drugs or whatever. I'm not going to go through details. But she was involved in quite a few addictions. And the parents, when they would try to talk to her, she would say to them, Leave me alone. I don't want to hear about God, about church, about you. If you talk to me about church, I will never call you again. I will change my telephone number. I will change my address. You will never know me again. And so they could not talk to her. So they said, would you pray for her? We started to pray for her. We added her name to our prayer list. And we didn't just pray for her. We pleaded. We labored in prayer. Like Jacob in the night. Like the woman going to the judge. We pleaded. Uh, it's not enough to pray for somebody and say, Lord be with Jimmy, Lord be with John, Lord be with Mary, amen. When your son has a car accident and he's in the ER, if you can imagine that and the doctor says he's not going to make it, you don't say, God be with my son, amen. You cry and you pray. If you really care. We pleaded for those names. Lord, we are not going to let you go before you do whatever it takes to turn them around. And as we prayed and we were studying, we got to a paragraph that says, work according to your prayers. Because some people only work and some people only pray. And you cannot only pray, but you cannot only work. You got also to pray because without God's blessing, you do nothing. And so we said we, we got to work. We got to ask God for, for wisdom. So we said, Lord, what shall we do to reach this girl? And God impressed us to do a little research. And we learned that she likes mountains. She likes mountains. Well, we liked mountains. So my friend and I, we decided to call her. And I, I said to the telephone, I said, hey, how are you doing? She says, who are you? If I would have said, I am your friend, she would have hung up because she had no friends. I said, I am your enemy. She says, what? I said, you heard me. And she says, what do you want? If I would have said, I want you to come to church, she would have hung up. I said, I want to make your life miserable. He said, what? I said, you heard me. How can you make my life miserable? You don't even know me over the telephone. I said, well, I know you like mountains. Yes, I do. I like mountains, and I'm going to beat you in mountains. I'm, I'm going to tell you that you are a baby compared to me. You know nothing about mountains. Oh, she was so frustrated. You tell me that I, nothing, I know nothing about mountains? I've been in every mountain in Romania. I said, that's children's play. I've been in every mountain, on every route, on every path, in every cabin that you can find on the map. She said, that's impossible. I said, I have pictures everywhere. I said, for the last four years, every weekend, I am in the mountains. And I've been in the mountains before. And she says, I don't believe it. I said, okay, I'm going to show you pictures. And then I said, you like hiking? She said, yes. I said, I've been hiking in the places that you don't even dream to think of. She said, where? I said, do you know where is the cross? The mountain goes this way, and then on the other side is straight all the way down. So many you know, like over 1,000 meters, all the way goes down and you see the road so small and the homes and the cars so small. I've been hiking there. That's impossible. I said, nope. You cannot go. I said, yep. Did you have ropes? I said, no, empty-handed. You are crazy. Can you prove it? I said, yeah, I have pictures. She said, you beat me. I told you I would make your life miserable. 
I can beat you in mountains. And she said, so, so what happened? I said, I fell from there. Impossible, you would be dead. I said, I fell from there. And the youth from the church with the pastor and the pastor's wife, they were walking like normal people, left and right and left and right. And when you get to the edge, you go left. And, and they were watching us. And my friend was going, and then he was waiting, and I was going, and I was waiting. And I said, we had ski boots. And the ski boots didn't have holes. They had hooks for the shoelaces. And at a certain point, where we, we were kind of in the middle of the mountain, and we were tired and perspired, my hand slipped, and I fell. And my hook from my shoe got hooked in his hook from his shoe. And I was hanging like a pendulum, head down from a hook. And my friend said, don't move. And he had a stick, and he held himself from a rock, and he put the stick down. And when I grabbed the stick, my leg shoo, went down. And then I was hanging from my hands. And I said, they, it happens that the young people from the church, they were watching, and they started to scream. And the pastor's wife was praying, Lord, save them, please, and so on and so forth, you know. And she says, you are crazy. I said, I told you I can beat you in the mountains. She says, okay, what do you want now? And I said, well, we go to the mountains in a place that you don't even know that there are mountains there. It's called Borsha. I said, in the north of the country. And there are lakes that have iodine, and they are very cold. And there are mineral sp sparkling water coming from the ground. And the beauties are, it, leave you sp it will leave you speechless. Do you want to go? She says, oh, I would love to go. But I don't want to go with you church people. Because you get together and you sing kumbaya and you pray. And I hate church. I said, listen, when we pray and sing and study, you stay away. No, because you are going to invite me and you are going to give me a sermon and tell me that I have to repent. I said, no, I promise I'll give you no sermon. No, 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 because you are going to still come and invite me. In fact, I want you not to come. You see, if you ask them to come, they don't come. But if you tell them to stay away, they want to come. You know? so I said, I want you not to come. Please stay away. She said, why? Because you are evil. You drink, you do this or that. I don't want you to infect our youth. Please stay away. She says, deal. Don't invite me to your sermons. No, we'll not ever invite you. You stay in your tent and leave us alone. Okay, then I'm coming. She came to the mountains. We were two weeks in the mountains camping. From where the train drops you, we took a truck like that had workers in the back, and we went another two hours to the mountain, and from there we walked six hours up the mountain. There up the mountain, we put the tents. After we put the tents in, in like a semi-circle, she got in her tent. We said, let's have worship. We built a bonfire in front of her tent and started to sing Kumbaya. <laughs> she came out. You said you'll not invite me. I said, who invited you? Go back in your tent and leave us alone. We started to preach. She got out. She moved her tent. After she finished, like it took her one hour to move her tent. We moved the fire pit in front of her tent and we continue our sermon. She got out. She moved the tent again. It took her another one hour. She was tired after six hours trip and so many hours with the train. And, and then we moved the fire again and we continue to preach and to talk and to pray. She came out. I put two pillows on my head and I can still hear you. I said, get in the tent. Nobody invited you. Please leave us alone to pray. After three days... She came out and she said, I got tired of your sermons. You preach transformation. You preach salvation. It is impossible. It is a lie. People don't change. Do people change? How many sermons have you heard in a lifetime? How many camp meetings? How many Sabbaths? Have you changed? Is another, another one sermon going to make a difference? I'm not saying yes or no. I'm just, it's a rhetoric question. You answer for yourself. She said, people don't change. She says, I've been praying. I ask God for help. I struggle with this and that and that. And God never helped me. I am still struggling. I don't believe it's real. People have no power to change. And after she was done, you know, venting and being angry, I said, you are absolutely right. Am I right? I said, you said people have no power to change. I agree with you. Then why do you preach? I said, you are deaf. You need to listen carefully. I never said that you have the power to change. I said that God has the power to change. I can do all things in... 
And the keyword in Greek is in, the chiastic structure, top, it's in. In Christ. If you are out of Christ, in John 15 says, abide in me and I in you, and you'll produce much fruit. But separating from me, you can do how much? So stop trying, because the Bible is pretty plain. Separated from me, in your power, you can do nothing. Abide in me and I in you. That's the key. And I said, you keep trying in vain because Satan is more powerful than you in human power. You don't have to fight against powers and principalities. You have to fight against the rulers of darkness in heavenly places, against Satan. And against Satan, you have no power. Unless the spirit of prophecy says you receive power from the source of all power from above, she says. Unless you receive power, you have no power. So stop trying. I remember when I was a kid, I would catch fly, uh, fleas. I don't know in English, fleas from my dog. Fleas uh, from my dog. And I would put them in the tub where you go for a, to take a bath, you know, a tub, and a shower. And I was watching the, the fleas trying to escape. Tang, tang, jumping. And none of them jump more than this, like Three, four inches. And the tub was so tall. And after about 10, 20 jumps, they all gave up. That's our fight against sin. We try again and again and again and again and again. And then we they get discouraged. And some people become Pharisees. They, while they may still do whatever is wrong, they judge others and blame others for their own sins. And they are fake. Oh, happy Sabbath, happy Sabbath. How are you doing? Great, amazing. How are you doing? Great. Praise the Lord. All good, all perfect. Until they go home. You know what I mean? I was at the church somewhere. I don't tell you the location. How are you doing, brother? Good, you good. Everything okay? Yes, job, yes. Family, yes. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And after the church, he comes to me and says, by the way, pastor, my wife left me. I said, you told me that everything is good. Oh, we say so. We don't mean it. Yeah. Either you become fake or some people become discouraged and depressed and they lose hope. And very few people experience real growth. How do you experience real growth? So I talked to her and I said, all over in the Bible, all over in the spirit of prophecy, people have no power in their own power or wisdom. Power comes from God. And if you try alone, you will never manage your war is not to fight Satan in your power. Your war is to be always connected because if you remain in Christ and Christ in you, Christ in you is the hope of glory. He who has Christ, in Greek, it's a present continued tense. And the letters from Greek imply that it's not only a present continued tense, that is repetitive. It's not enough to invite Christ once. You need to keep inviting him every day. Please come into my heart today and tomorrow again and next day. One day separated, you are done. So he who calls the name of the Lord, in Greek, the presence of the Lord, he who calls the name of the Lord shall be saved. In a different verse, he who has present continued tense, Christ has life. He who has no Christ has no life. Separated from me, you can do nothing. It cannot be more clear than that. So I told her, your most important challenge is not to change your own nature, but to be continually connected. As the Spirit of Prophecy says that Enoch walked with God, period, and the next sentence, it says, he was continually connected, never separating from God, aware of God's presence depending on God. Do you understand what it means to walk? Because we sing, and he walks with me, and he does, but we don't mean it. What does it mean to be continually connected? In the Desire of Ages, it says that Christ every morning prayed until he was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And then through the day, he never separated from the Father. He didn't do his own plans. He didn't do his own ideas or actions. He didn't speak his own words. He continually depended on the Father. And then he says in the next sentence, and I do have the paragraphs, so should we continually be connected and depend on God. Is it possible to change? In fact, how do you get saved? 
Let me give you a few examples that are not fair. Rahab was a prostitute. Abraham was a spiritual, dedicated man of God. He left his country. He sacrificed his son. He lived all his life for God. He was an example. How many of them, which one of the two will be saved? Both. Is it fair? Isaiah was a prophet. He was cut with the saw. He was dedicated. He was a good prophet. He served God all his life. Okay. And now you think about Ruth. She was a Moabite and she did nothing except to marry a man. They are both saved. Let's think about another example. Paul, he was an apostle. He built churches. He planted churches. He was persecuted for faith. And then the thief on the cross. He was a thief. How many of them will be saved? Which one of them? Both. Is it fair? Is it fair that I work all my life and somebody comes in the 11th hour, as the parable says, and we get the same salary? Is it fair? You are not saved by what you do. You are saved by who lives in you. Salvation is not what you do. Salvation is a person. It's called Jesus Christ. Now you may say, what about the good deeds? Should we do anything good or it doesn't matter? Sure it does, because Jesus says, if you love me, you obey my commandments. And I could give you many Bible verses, not one. Jesus says, you'll know them by their fruits. If you have Jesus, you don't go around breaking the commandments. If Jesus lives in you, you are delighted to keep his law. You follow me? I will get there. I will explain it. How do you acquire righteousness? How do you experience salvation? We are all saved by grace through faith. It's not of yourself. It's the gift of God. So nobody could brag with it. The righteous shall live by faith. Well, let me explain a little about faith before we move on. Number one, faith doesn't give you any merits. Oh, I believe, if I believe, God has to save me. Oh, I prayed and I believe, so God has to answer. Some people say, brother, if you believe when you pray, God will do it. Like saying, faith is abracadabra. If you believe, God has no choice. Whatever you ask, if you believe, if you ask for a Mercedes and you believe, God has to give it to you. Faith is not to manipulate God. Faith is not to twist God's arm to do what you ask. Faith is to manipulate you to accept what he wants when you don't understand. Faith is not to change God. Faith is to change you. So when you don't understand what is going on, you trust in his wisdom and love and his promises. Faith is not to change God but to change you. Do you follow me? People fast so God would answer the prayer. Fasting is not that God would hear your voice. It's to clear your mind that you hear God's voice. And so, let's move on a little. What if you say, Pastor, I want to believe, but I don't have faith. Well, the Bible says that God gave everyone a measure of faith. I hope you know the Bible verse. God gave everyone, means everyone, a measure of faith. Well, my measure is very small. Well, Jesus, talking about faith, says that if you have faith like a mustard seed, and that's literally a mustard seed on the tip of my finger. And the tree in the right is in California, and that's a mustard tree. Jesus says that if you have faith like a, so small, you can move mountains. Jesus doesn't talk about the size of faith. In fact, in Greek, he talks about the properties, biological properties of growing into a tree. Basically, what he means, if you exercise the faith that you have, it's going to keep growing until it's going to become bigger and bigger. That's the Greek grammar. Basically, if you have even small faith and you exercise faith, it's going to grow. It's like whatever flowers you water, those flowers grow. Whatever flowers you nurture, those flowers grow. If you nurture doubt, if you dwell on doubt, if you talk doubt, you pray doubt, you think doubt, doubt is going to grow. Whatever you fix your eyes on and your mind on. But if you talk faith and don't allow yourself to doubt, if you pray faith, if you water faith, if you use faith, your faith is going to develop more and more and more. Because when you see how God works, he's going to strengthen your faith. But the point is, it's like the man, believe 
Lord, I believe, help my, my unbelief. If you exercise faith, it's going to grow. So let me explain something about salvation. How do you experience righteousness? How do you experience salvation? I'm going to pick an example from the Bible and draw a parallel with our life. It says that Abraham believed and it was credited in other translation, considered. It doesn't say that he was righteous. It says that he was considered. There are three stages of salvation. And I, I'm in hurry because I want us to finish. It's justification, sanctification, glorification. Quickly, justification takes one moment, one day. It's one event. Sanctification takes a life. And glorification takes an eternity. Justification, when God considers you righteous, but you are not righteous. Abraham was considered righteous not after he sacrificed his son, not after he left his country, before he did anything in the beginning, in Genesis 15, when God called him, before he left his country. Justification, when God considers you righteous, but you are a newborn baby, you are not yet mature. Sanctification, when God makes you righteous. And glorification, when God takes the sin away and there is no more sinful nature. Now, let me explain. Abraham was considered righteous because he believed. In Hebrew 11, he says that Israel didn't enter the promised land because of what? Because of their... And it doesn't say because of the giants. It doesn't say because of the walls of Jericho. It doesn't say because of any other challenges, but because they didn't believe that God is able to deliver. They didn't believe when they prayed that God is able to answer. Please, Lord, would you forgive my sins? And then you doubt, did he forgive me? Please, Lord, would you change me because I have no power to change? But then they say, I'm not sure I changed. They didn't believe that God is able. So many times we pray, and because we don't understand how it's going to happen, we don't believe. We humans need to have some logic, some understanding in order to believe. Some science, excuse me, that would explain it in order to believe it. Faith is not what you see, is not what you smell, is not what you touch. It has no color. It has no explanation. Faith is the substance of unseen things. Substance, two words in Latin, sub and stanza. It means what stands under and holds whatever is above. Faith is the foundation that holds the Christian life. Without faith, you have no Christian life. It's all an illusion. And so, faith is not what you prove. You go to prayer and you try to understand in order to believe. You try to make some plans. How can you do it in order that it would happen? Faith is not what you do. How could Noah understand the flood? Because it never rained before. How could Abraham understand that he would get his son back if he would sacrifice his son? How could Joseph would understand that he would be over his brothers when he was sold a slave and then put in prison? You know the story because you read it in the Bible, but Joseph didn't read the story. He didn't know what the end from the beginning. How could he believe? But they choose to believe that God is able to keep his word, that God doesn't lie. I don't understand how he will do it. I don't deserve it. I cannot do it. I don't see the hope or the light at the end of the tunnel. But I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that he loves me. I know that he promised. I know that he is able. I know that he doesn't lie. So I don't know how, but I'm going to trust in him. Do you follow me? That's faith. Faith is not science. Faith is not feelings. Faith is a mind decision. We will get there. Abraham believed. And because he believed God, it was credited to him as righteousness. I want you to understand this. When was righteous credit to Abraham? We talked about that. The Lord brought Abraham outside and said, Look to heaven. Count the stars. Can you number them? And he said, So shall your descendants be. Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteous. In Hebrew translation, and I did the translation myself word by word. The word 
it was considered to him as righteous is, and God considered him as righteous as God himself. Can you grasp those words? In the moment when you believe, you are not righteous yet. But when you pray for forgiveness and you believe, God takes Jesus' divine, godly, perfect righteousness, white as snow, puts it on you. And he takes your sinfulness and puts it on Jesus. And he looks to you like you never did it. And he throws your sin at the bottom of the sea. Mariana Trench, right in the middle of the ocean. And he says, he never did it. Isn't that amazing? Amazing grace. How sweet the sound to save a wretch like me. That's the reason in heaven you are going to throw the crowns at Jesus' feet and say, I don't deserve it. And so, Abraham believed. I want you to read the next uh, verse in Romans chapter uh, 4. Abraham, who contrary to any hope, I mean, when God talked to him, he was 75. Have you seen anybody 75? Can you tell them that they will have children? Come on. Against any human logics, against any human hope, he believed in the midst of the crisis, in the midst of the impossibility, he believed that God is able to deliver what he promised. He didn't consider his own body and Sarah's body, that they were dead. I mean, when they had a baby, he was 100 and she was 90. He did not waver at the promise of God. But he was strengthened in faith. And he was fully convinced that what God promised, he is able to perform. Basically, I don't need to understand how God will do it. God has power to say and it happens. Let there be light. Be still. God has power to say it is dabar. In Hebrew means that when God says it has energy, it happens. Nature obeys him. If God says, let there be three, there are trees. And Abraham didn't try to, how he's going to do it? Oh, is it possible? If God said, I don't need to understand. Abraham was fully convinced that what God promised, he's able to perform, and God doesn't lie. The spirit of prophecy says that to doubt God is code to call him a liar. My God doesn't lie. That's the reason I believe in him. And he was able, he believed that God is able to perform. Therefore, it was counted to him as righteousness. Well, let me give you the story a little. I want you to imagine. It's not in the Bible. This is now just my mind, okay? Don't tell people around. That's what the pastor said is in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. This is just trying to process that Abraham was a normal human being. He's not, he was not Superman driving supercar, okay? He was a normal human being with challenges and temptations and problems. And, and like everybody... Tempted like everybody. Okay, so I want you to consider Abraham being 30 and Sarah being 20 and they are in Andrews University and he is taking law and she is taking nursing. And he sees her and says, man, she is absolutely beautiful. I want to date her. And he, he brings an ice cream and they eat together and they talk and then tomorrow they talk again and the next day they talk again and they become friends and they start dating and they date until they finish college and they finish college and they get married. And after they get married, he's 34 and she's 24 and they move to Florida and he has a nice practice and she has a job in hospital and they buy a nice house uh, by the water and they have a nice big screen TV and a nice car in the garage and they say, now we have a salary, we have a life, it's time to have babies. And I want you to draw a parallel between their attempt to have babies and our attempt to get righteousness and salvation and see how they got babies to know how you get righteousness because it's a parallel. And you'll find this parallel I could give you location. And so, Abraham and Sarah tried to have babies, but they didn't manage. So what they did, as we do, when we don't manage and we fail, we try again and again, even harder. They tried again, and they didn't manage. So what they did, they started to eat tofu and broccoli. Maybe if you eat tofu and broccoli, maybe you acquire righteousness. Now, don't get me wrong. Is it wrong to eat healthy? Absolutely not. When you have tofu and broccoli, invite me over, I'm going to eat it. 
and I'm going to enjoy it. We should live healthy because we are, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We should have health and a clear mind to be able to serve God. There is nothing wrong with that. It's good. It's the right hand of the gospel. Okay, but listen carefully. Just because you eat healthy, does it make you righteous? I've seen people eating healthy and cursing each other. Do you know what I am talking about? Just because you eat healthy, does it give you any right to salvation? Absolutely not. I've seen Baha'i people, and I've seen Muslim people, and I've seen Christian people, and I've seen all type of people eating vegan and still not being sure of salvation. It's good to eat healthy, but it doesn't give you merits or salvation. So they tried, what if we eat healthy? Maybe we get pregnant. Still didn't happen. And then they went to the best how to get pregnant seminars. Mark Finley, Sean Boonstra, uh, you follow me? Maybe if you listen to the best sermon ever, maybe you get righteousness. And they still didn't get babies. And they heard a life of sermons on how to get babies, and they never got right, uh, babies. You follow me? That's as we do. We try maybe another sermon, maybe another. Is it good to listen to sermons to go to evangelism? Oh, yes. Just the fact that you listen is going to make you righteous or save you? No. So many people go alive to church. And then when you hear what they did, you say, how in the world could they do that? You follow me? Does it change you? No. Does it give you babies? No. Eventually, they gave up. And they said, we cannot do it. I don't do what I want. I do what I hate. Who is going to change me? And he was now old. 75, when God called him out of Chaldea. And Sarah was 65. And the Bible says that she was beyond the time when she could get pregnant. Way after the menopause. Way too late. She was dead in this regard. And God calls him and says, now let me make a parenthesis. Why would God answer your prayer always in the last moment? God is never early. And he's never late either. Why would God wait to that moment? Because we humans have a tendency to take credit for God's work. You follow me? I've seen so many times when people pray and then God works. And then people say, I did it. Did you hear my sermon? Did you see what I did? This is how many I baptized. Taking credit. And the spirit of prophecy says clearly that Satan was the one who tried to take God's glory for self. And every time we take credit for what God does, we exhibit, exhibit Satan's character. The desire to take credit for self. Instead of in humility saying, Lord, it all belongs to you. Thank you. Praising him because he deserves all praises. You follow me? So God waits until you hit the bottom and you know that you cannot do it. And when you know that you cannot do it, he works. So you'll know that it was his grace alone. Amazing grace. Unbelievable, undeserved, infinite grace. Love that you cannot go under, you cannot go above, you cannot go around. It says... To know the love, listen carefully, that surpasses any understanding. How can you know something that surpasses any possible understanding? Spiritual prophecy says that in eternity, we will try to learn more and more of God's love and character, and we will never understand it fully. And so, back to the story. Abraham is 75, Sarah is 65, and God says, you'll have so many children like the stars. And Abraham doesn't say, come on, come on, Lord, give me a break, I'm 75. He says, you know what? I cannot do it. I've tried really hard. But God can do it. He is able to save the thief on the cross. He is able to save me too. He can save the uttermost. His blood is sufficient. His power is sufficient. He knows how to do, what to do. I believe in him. And because of his belief. Now listen carefully to what I say next. Because people say, Pastor, I believe and it didn't happen. He was 75. When did he have a baby? When he was how long did it take between the promise and the fulfillment? 25 years. Listen carefully. Answer to prayer, it's a process, not an event. What did I say? In the Bible, it took Joseph 17 years to, be, to get the fulfillment to the promise that his family would bow down before him. It took Moses 40 years to deliver people. It took Abraham 25 years to receive a baby. It took Noah 120 years to see the ark fulfilled and the flood. It, do you want me to continue? The shortest answer to prayer is Daniel, three weeks. <laughs> Over 92% of the Bible prayers get answers in time. 
When you start to pray, God starts to work. But it takes time to deliver because God has to work with people and people are stubborn and God cannot force them. So God has to change people until they are ready for the answer. Moses had to develop a character that would be ready for God's plan. Joseph had to develop a character. You follow me? And so God patiently works with you. The problem is that we don't have patience with ourselves. God has patience with us. And so, it took 25 years. And Abraham didn't have the patience to wait 25 years. And when he was 86, 11 years later, he slept with his servant. Because that's what we do. God saves me, but I need to help him. Because God is old. And he doesn't have enough power. So God needs a little help. So I'm going to do a little and he does a little. I do whatever God cannot do. God doesn't need your help. You should do only what he says. When God says, move, you move, like Israel. When God says, stop, you stop. When God says, attack, you don't say, Jericho is too big. You attack. When God says, do not attack, go around, you go around. You are supposed to do something, but not what you think. Only what he says. Jesus says in John, I don't do my own works. Not because he was not smart, but because he obeyed the Father. He says, I do the works of the Father, the works that the Father gives me. Shouldn't we do the same? And so, he slept with his servant, and that made a mess. When you try to help God, you make a mess. And then later, when he was 100, he got a baby. Now, I want you to think about it, because we read it, and we think that it's easy. It's not. If you are Abraham, would you be willing to wait 25 years for an answer to prayer? We sometimes don't have patience to wait three months. And we lose faith and we get discouraged. Oh, I've been praying for three months. Let me read this quotation. Recite, I know it by memory. To every honest prayer. Word by word. I give you the quotation. To every, how many? To every honest prayer, an answer will come. But listen carefully. Comma. But it will be wrong to assume that God answers the way you want in the time you want. And now you flip a few pages later and he says, if we knew the end from the beginning, we would choose the same path. You follow me? God answers better than you pray in the best possible time. Because you have in mind one thing and God has in mind everything. When he answers, he answers to the whole big picture that you don't see. And you have in mind this and God has in mind everything, including eternity. And so... Back to the story. Abraham is 99, or almost 100. He goes to the gas station. He cannot send his children to go get gas because he has no children. He gets in the car and he's like, his head is shaking, his hands are shaking, 100 years old. He gets the pump and he cannot even hold the pump in the tank. And on the other side of the pump is Jimmy, his neighbor. Hey man, I heard you changed your name. Oh, oh. You are not Abraham, you are Abraham. Uh Uh, You know what it means? Uh, Yes, it means the father of many nations. Uh How many children do you have? Zero. How old are you? One hundred. You follow me? What would people say if you still have faith that when you are in prison, the others are going to come down and bow before you? What people would say if you keep building an ark for 120 long years? What would people say? It's foolishness. God's wisdom is foolishness for the Greeks. You follow me? Faith is not what people approve or understand. Faith is such a relationship with God that you trust in him regardless of circumstances. You follow me? You trust even like Job when you lose everything, including your health, your family, your possessions, everything. And everybody says, where is God? And you say, I know my Redeemer. I don't understand what is going on. But I will still trust in him and praise him. That's faith. Faith is not when everything goes good and you believe in God. Faith is in the midst of crisis. Where you don't put your eyes on challenges and impossibilities and crisis. But you put your eyes on your Lord and you say, I don't understand it. But I know him and that's enough. He's working on me. And so, Abraham at 100... Hey, brother, if you are 100, do you still believe? Yes. When? I don't care. If God says so, I'm going to rejoice that I have babies before I see the babies. I want you to remind, remember Jericho. God told Joshua that they should walk around Jericho one time each day. You remember? 
Seven times, seven day. After that, blow the trumpet, you remember? And then, what were they supposed to do? To shout. You remember? It says in Hebrew, shout of victory. Were they supposed to shout of victory after the walls came down or before the walls came down? Before. You are supposed, Jesus says, believe that you have received them and you will have them. You are supposed to believe so strong to the point that you rejoice of having babies before you had babies. You rejoice that you got the answer before you got the answer. You say, I know God and I am going to jump and scream because I know I already got the answer. It's a matter of time until I see it, but it's mine because God promised. And I have no doubt that it's mine. If God said it's yours, it's mine. I can have a party. It's mine. God cannot lie. That's faith. Abraham believed even when he was 100. Faith is to believe God and his word against any human hope, circumstances, to put your trust in him, to fix your eyes on him, and no, or nothing else. Not on challenges, not on crisis. You put your eyes on crisis, you get depressed. Satan wants you discouraged. You put your eyes on God, you get joyful and peaceful. It says in Isaiah, you keep him in perfect peace, him whose eyes are fixed on you. Hello? You keep him in perfect peace. Jesus says, I give you my peace, a peace that the world cannot. Look around when people are scared to death and lose their minds. People that fix their eyes on God, they have peace. Do you understand? Righteousness and salvation is the presence of God in you at all times. What did I say? Righteousness, salvation, growth, victory, results are not what you do in human education, experience, training, power, wisdom. It's not by no might nor by power, but by my spirit. All of those are good. Education is absolutely good. The Bible says you should be head, not tail. Education is good. To, to read, to study, to eat healthy, to, all of them are absolutely necessary. But salvation, growth, victory, all of these are the presence of God in you. When you focus on God and you connect with him and you never separate. And you say, Lord, I have a tendency to forget. I have a tendency to get busy and forget about you and then separate. When I separate, I am exposed and then Satan attacks me. Satan is not afraid of what I eat. Satan is not afraid that I know the state of the dead. Satan is not afraid that I know the 2300 days and nights prophecy. But Satan is afraid when you come and move in me. So Lord, please move in me. He says the spirit of prophecy that Satan and his hosts tremble and run when God's people pray. You follow me? So, Lord, move in me. Lord, I have a tendency to forget, to get busy. Help me to pray like three, five, seven, seven times a day to the point that I get used to stay connected and never separate. Peter on the water. As long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he could walk on waters. Impossible. As, long as, he took, as soon as he took his eyes, he sank. Our only hope to be in Christ. There is no other way to be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It's none of yourself. It's the gift of God. Listen. Can an Ethiopian change his skin? Or a leopard his spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to do evil. Moreover, the Bible says that even our righteous deeds, not our sinful, our good deeds are like thick, filthy rocks. Now, if I compare my deeds with your deeds, I may seem a little better than you. I am a pastor. I am preaching. You know? I sacrifice myself for God. I may be a little better than you, like one inch above. Can you see how holy I am? If I compare people with people, but if I compare myself with God, when I see God, I say, woe to me. I am a wretched man. I am a sinful, dirty lips, sinful lips among people with sinful lips. I am done. I am done. When I see God, like Daniel, I collapse. Like, like John the Revelator, I collapse. Like Ezekiel, I collapse. When you see people, you feel good. But when you look to God, you realize, compared to God, you are nothing. You deserve to die. Therefore, because we cannot change our nature, and even if we change our behavior, we still don't deserve salvation, eternity, because we know that we need to always stay connected. Let me read this quotation for you. Money cannot buy, talking about righteousness, money cannot buy it. 
Intellect cannot procure it. Wisdom cannot attain it. You can never hope by own efforts to secure it. But God gives it to you as a gift. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that absolutely amazing? Now, people tell me, Pastor, I've been praying, I've been studying, I'm trying to stay connected, and I still feel bad, and I still sin. And I tell them, my brother, listen carefully. The greater the distance between you and God, the less you understand your state, your sinfulness, and you feel good about yourself. But the closer the distance to Jesus, when you see Jesus, you realize how you are. The more you are aware of your own sinfulness and the worse you feel. So the fact that you feel worse, it's good news. It means that you are close to Jesus. Because if you feel good, it means that you are far from Jesus. When you go to the doctor and he tells you you are sick, it's good news because before you are sick, but you didn't know. Now at least you know. <coughs> Listen, this paragraph. You are a sinner. You cannot atone for your past sins. Only the blood of Christ. You cannot change your heart and make yourself holy. That's for the future. But God promised to do all of this in you through Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You must believe his promise. God is able to deliver the uttermost. You believe the promise and God will supply the facts. He will make you whole. Listen carefully now. Some people, Pastor, but I don't feel it. They think that you can feel God's work. It's like wind, it's like electricity. Oh, God is working, I can feel it. You don't feel it. It's like the Holy Spirit. Jesus says in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, the Holy Spirit's work is like the wind. You don't see it, you don't feel it. But you see the effects. When God works in you, you don't feel it. Because God works through daily small circumstances to develop patience and faith and whatever. But five years down the road, when you look back, you see that God has been faithful at working. And so, listen carefully. Do not wait to feel it. But say, I believe. Why say? Because whatever you say influences the way you think. Talk faith. Don't talk doubt. Say, I believe. Because God has promised. And praise the Lord. Thank him as you have already received them. I like this paragraph. To the simple fact of believing God. The Holy Spirit has already begotten a new life in your heart. You are a child born into the family of God and he loves you just as he loves his son, Jesus Christ. Wow. As you read God's promises, remember that they are an expression of unutterable love and pity. The great God of infinite love is drawn toward the sinner with boundless compassion. Yes, believe that God is your helper. He wants to restore his moral image in you. As you draw near to him, with confession and repentance, he will draw near to you with mercy, forgiveness, and a new life. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? So let, me, let, me, let me give you an example, and then I, I finish. Then you say, Pastor, what is the reason for good works? Should we do good works? Well, I just told you before. Jesus says, if you love me, you obey my commandments. James says, you prove your faith by acting. Let me explain. In the Bible, in Hebrew 11, he says, Abraham believed and therefore he left his country. That means that he did something because he believed God's promise. He obeyed God. When God said leave, he left. So he acted. Israel, when God said move, they moved. When God said walk around Jericho, they walked. They acted because they believed that God will keep his word. He says in the Bible, for instance, Noah believed and he built an ark. He built. That's an action. When you believe, you act on it. If I say to my wife, I love you, I have to do something. Not enough to say, and then I start beating her or, or cheating on her. Or I say, hey, go and wash dishes. I'm not going to help you. I love you, and that's enough. If I love her, I say, honey, you came from work, and I was home today. Sit down. I'm going to get you the best food. You just relax. I'm going to give you a food massage, and, and uh, I'll prepare. Uh, is it right? And so if I love her, I act on it. If I just say, I love you, hey, go and prepare the meal for you. Hey, what are you doing? If you love, you act on it. If not, it's only words. And Jesus says you'll know them not by their words, but by their fruits. If you love me, you obey me. David says, your, your law is a delight. 
When I love you, I enjoy obeying you. Well, let me explain where the good deeds come into the picture. Let me explain. Let's suppose, let's just pretend, imagine that you are broke. You lost your job, okay? You got the paper from the bank that you'll be foreclosed in two months from now, so you lose your house. People will come to possess your car because you didn't pay the payments and they are going to take your car away. Your shoes are broken. You didn't pay electricity and they cut it off. You didn't pay cell phone, okay? You have no money for food. You are done. You have a school loan of 60000 and you have credit card debts of 30000 And you started to pay interest. And the, debt, the credit card debtor started to call you and you don't want to answer the phone because you hate them calling you, okay? You are done. And your neighbor is Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos. I don't know. I don't care. Somebody that is Jeff Bezos, okay? He's multi-billionaire. And you are desperate. You, you, are, you have two, chick, two kids. You, you have no food. You didn't eat for five days. You are broke. And, and so you go and knock in his door to Jeff Bezos and you say, man, listen, I'm broke, man. I need, I need some works to save myself. I need some works to pay my debt. I need some works to, to get myself out of trouble as we try hard to save ourselves. I need, I, need to do, I need to do something to help myself. And he says, how much do you owe? Let's do the math. I am a business person. How much do you owe? 500000 to the house, 30000 to the credit card, 50000 to school loan, uh, all together 700000 He says, and you want to work to make 700000 Yeah. Pfft, are you crazy? How long is it going to take you? How many lives? You cannot help yourself. Oh, yes, please, please. Look, listen, man, it snowed last night. Let me shovel your driveway so I can pay my debt. He says, help yourself. I'm going to give you $20 an hour. You are two hours. He gives you $40. Is it works or grace? It works. You worked. He gives you $40. Does it pay your debt? Does it save you? Huh? <laughs> it's not enough to go to Walmart or to Kroger or to whatever, uh, to, you know, Myers. $40, it, it, you need $200 to fill your card. You know what I'm talking about? It doesn't even help you to eat today. Moreover, to pay your debt $700,000. But you worked two hours. You still didn't pay your debt. You are still miserable. So you go back tomorrow. Please, man, give me more work. I need to save myself. I need to pay my debt. Please give me more work. And he says, man, don't you get it? It's not going to help you. Your works are not going to pay your debt. It's way too big. You'll never be able to pay Jesus' blood. You'll never be able to pay eternity. How can you pay for eternity? Come on. You cannot pay your debt. Man, give me more works. But we didn't get snow last night. I have no work. Let me clean your kitchen. I have a lady who cleans my kitchen. My kitchen is clean. Let me dig your garden. I don't have a garden. Okay, let, let me do something for you. Okay, does the kitchen. You go and you work five minutes because the kitchen is clean. And after five minutes you say, I did some work. Am I saved? And he says, well, $20 an hour. You work five minutes. Keep here $3. Huh? <laughs> but he says, you know, I'm going to be gracious to you. He gives you $100. And but work only five minutes. Is that grace or works? It's both. Because you did work five minutes. That's what some Christians say. God does a lot and I do a little. Does it save you? 100. You don't even fill the cart with groceries. Moreover to pay your debt, you know. So you go next day. I need more works. And you try every day the same story and you don't get it. I need more works. I'm struggling. I'm really... And he says, don't you get it that whatever you do is not going to pay your salvation. Sit down. Let's talk. I don't have time to sit down. I have no time for relationship. Sit down. Okay. And you sit down. And he says, tell me your life. And you talk for two hours and you tell him everything. And he says, man, I never knew that about you. You know what? I like you. And then he tells you his life. And you say, man, I never knew that about you either. I like you too. And after four hours, five hours of talk, you say, you know, I'm glad we know each other. We are friends. I'm going to do something for you. I have 30 billions. What is $500 million? I'm going to give you $500 million. And you look to him and you think, he's lying. He's making fun of me. And he says, not happy. Okay, I'm going to give you $700 million. And I say, what? He says, okay, I'm going to give you $800 million. Are you happy now? You say, man, please don't make fun of me. Please don't give me false hope. This is too big to believe. This is too unreal. It's he takes the checkbook and he writes $800 million for you. He gives you the check. You look at the check. Is this fake or real? That's what we do with God's grace. We say, is it fake or real? You know? And he says, it's real. And you run to the bank and you give it. Please, will you check this? And they check it. This is a real check. And it's covered in his account. Please transfer it before he will change his mind. And they transfer the money. And you still don't believe it. It's too big to be true, you know? So you go online on your computer and... 
800 million, you lose your breath. You need to breathe deep, you know. 800, wow! 800 million, I don't have to work forever. Me or my children or my grandchildren, I can live only from the interest. It not only pays my 700,000 that is a drop in the bucket. 800 million dollars! You call your wife and she says, you are crazy, honey. You ate too much pizza last night. You say, go online! She goes on. Oh, she calls the kids. She calls the sister. She calls everybody. She starts jumping and screaming. She goes crazy. 800 million! And you, then you stop for a second and you say, I forgot to say thank you. And you go back, you knock in the door and you say, man, how can I ever pay back? I can work all my life or a hundred lives if I would live a hundred times and still I cannot pay back. And I did nothing and you gave it to me. Man, I owe you everything. You understand? And then you say, at least I would say, please, let me shine your shoes. Please, let me clean your house. And he says, you don't need to. I gave it to you as a gift. Yes, I know. I'm not trying to pay back. I know that by shining your shoes, I'm not going to be able to pay back. But I, I appreciate you so much. I love you so much that I really want to do something for you. I, I want to serve you. I, he says, no need. Yes, I want to. Please let me do something for you just, just because I love you. Just, just to tell you thank you. Let me do something for you. He said, okay, let's, let's plant the garden together. Let's do it together. I like to be with you. And you plant the garden, and that's where works come in the picture. You don't work to gain the money. You work because you have received the money, and you are puzzled. His love constrains us. The Spirit of Prophecy says that at the foot of the cross, as we reflect His love, the more we understand His grace, the more we understand His salvation, the more we understand what He has done for us, the more we are transformed, puzzled, filled with His love to the point that we start to look more and more like Him, transformed into His image. The Bible says that we are changed from glory to glory by beholding. When you put your eyes on Him, you are, the more you understand, the more you are transformed and amazed and filled with His love. And then it makes no effort to show love and to be transformed. Because when you are so perplexed of his love, you cannot help but be transformed and love. Do you understand where works come in the picture? Sure you should work, but not to be saved, just because you have been saved. And people who don't work is because Jesus never lived in them. They have a theory of religion denying the power. If Jesus really moved in you, you cannot help but serve and you do it joyfully, not like a chore. You do it like a privilege. When you make a sacrifice, oh, I'm going to give you some money, I'm going to do evangelism, I'm going to clean the church, I'm going to paint the church. You know, man, I got to go again, we have work B. You say, compared to what Jesus has done for me, please bring it on, 10 work Bs. I'm going to be the first one and leave the last one. Compared to what Jesus has done for me, come on, the blood, eternal life, please let me be the first one to serve. That's when people understand the cross. Works are the result of being saved and understanding the magnitude, the infinity of salvation. Do you follow me? Let me close with a story. If you read about Dave Rover, Dave Rover was a soldier in Vietnam. He was a captain over a small group, company of soldiers, and they, gave, they got an impossible mission. Suicide mission. Basically, there was a location where nobody could get. There was no roads. You would get on the water, and there were enemies on the left side and right side of the water. And anybody who tried to get to that base would be killed. So they tried to go in the night, and they took a boat with no engines or no noise, and slowly, no lights, quietly, around 2 a.m., they started to go up the river. At a certain point, one of the soldiers, not being careful, careful, got a paddle above the water and slammed the water loud. As soon as they did that, the shootings started, and somebody from the enemy lines threw a phosphorus grenade into their boat. If you know anything about phosphorus, I've been in the army, I know a little about it. Phosphorus grenade, when it explodes, whatever it sprays with phosphorus, it burns in contact with oxygen forever until it consumes to zero, there is nothing left over. And you cannot put the fire off. You cannot do anything to turn the fire off. As long as it's oxygen, it's gonna burn to zero. When the phosphorus grenade landed in the boat, Dave Rover, to save his soldiers, 24, 25 soldiers, he took the grenade to throw it back and it exploded in his hand. He took his hand off, his leg off, the right side of his face off, 
and part of his stomach and ribs off. And he started to burn. He jumped in the water as long as he was aware, but then he had no air to breathe. When he got out, as soon as there was oxygen, he started to burn again. So they pushed him under the water, but then he needed oxygen. They got him out. He started to burn again. So they covered him with a blanket and cut here so he could breathe. He started to burn again. So they covered him again, made a hole and put a straw, and then put some clothing, some T-shirts, so there would be no oxygen on his face. And he would breathe through a tube. They took him to hospital in a coma. He was six months in hospital. They did several surgeries and kept him on life support. And after six months, he came back to life. He had a prostate hand, prostate leg, plastic ear, plastic nose, glass eye, plastic cheek. And here he had a, a plastic bag, like a, like a bag instead of stomach, that the food would go straight into the bag. Terrible. When he woke up, after six months, he said to the doctor, I want to see myself. And the doctor said, it's not a good idea. Please don't look in a mirror. And he said, give me a mirror. I'm a soldier. I'm tough. When they gave him the mirror, he said, I'm hopeless. I have no reason to live. I look like a monster. I cannot stand to see myself. How would the others? I cannot change myself. I have no power to change. I have no future. Basically, I am unlovable. Nobody can see me and love me. I don't want to live. And one of the nurses said, God's grace can change you and give you a hope and a future when you don't have one. He said, that's not real. That's impossible. Look at me. And after the nurse left, he pulled the life support to kill himself. Next day, when the nurse came, he says, why don't I die? She says, why? I pulled the life support. She says, no, you pulled the feeding tube, not the life support tube. You just go hungry. And she says, stop trying to kill yourself. God's grace is sufficient to save even the hopeless, the thief on the cross. He said, I don't believe that it's possible that anybody can love me or give me a hope or a future the way I am. That day, the wife of the next bed soldier came to see him. And that guy was missing one leg, that's it. When she saw him, she took the ring and said, I'm divorcing you. And Dave Rover said, imagine when my wife sees me. <laughs> Same day, in the afternoon, his wife came to see him. He covered himself with a blanket. She says, honey, I want to see you. No, I look like a monster. Honey, I want to see you. No, I don't look good. She says, honey, you never look good to begin with. When I married you, you didn't look good. I didn't marry you because you look good. I married you because you have a good heart. The fact that you try to save those soldiers at your own sacrifice, it tells me that you are the guy that I love. I love your heart, not your looks. Take the blanket off. No. And she pulled the blanket. And she saw him. He says, honey, you are my love. I love you just as more, even more than before. And she kissed him and she says, come home, Dave. The words are in the book with parentheses. And it's quotations. And she says, these are the very words she said. Come home, Dave. I cannot live without you. I want you back. I love you. And he says, in that moment, I understood God's grace. When I knew that I don't deserve it, I cannot change myself, and I have no future, and nobody can love me. I said, I love you. Come home. You belong home. Come home. And then, a few years later, they called him to tell the story. And he started to preach, and he started this way. God's grace. I understood it when my wife showed me love, and I could not understand how does it work. Now I know how God works. And that has changed me. And he said, before you experience that, you will never understand what he has done for you. And then they called him more and more and more. And then he was all over, scheduled in advance, preaching on how God works. And your goal, your best direction, the reason for your life is to know God. Because when you know God, that's eternal life. And you may do whatever, you may know whatever. If you don't know God, he will say, I don't know you. Lord, we have been going to church. I never knew you, you never knew me. Depart from me. He was started to tell people, your bigger problem is not this or that or that, is that you don't know your God. You need to know your God. You need to have such a relationship with him to the point that whatever happens, you have peace because you know you are never alone. Even if the mountains move, his love will never move from you. He has inscribed you on his palms. Can a mother forget his children? He still will never forget you. That's salvation. When you know God, 
That's eternal life, to know God. One time he was preaching and his plastic ear came off. And people, oh, and he put the ear back and everybody was saved and everybody said, amen. <laughs> Brothers, sisters, what would be the benefit to go to church a whole life and never have a relationship with God? We would fool ourselves. We will be the most miserable of all people. Not hot, not cold. It's good to go to church. But the most important part of the Christian life is to be in a, such a close relationship with God as people in the Bible have been to the point that you walk with God and you hear Him and you talk to Him and you depend on Him and you know Him and you trust in Him. That doesn't happen overnight. That's a progression. You start from being a baby when you are born again, like the thief on the cross, and you keep growing. And God works in you as long as you daily call his presence. And then he gets you here, and then he gets you here, until the statue of fullness of Christ, the maturity, when you don't drink milk anymore and you are not a baby anymore. And now listen carefully. In this process, regardless if you are here, the thief on the cross, or here, the woman at the well, or here... You or here me, you know, I'm better than you. Or here, Mother Teresa, or here, Paul the Apostle, or here. Doesn't matter where you are in the process, Isaiah, you know. Doesn't matter. If you die tonight or if Jesus comes tonight, if you are continually in Jesus, you are saved. Not because you are here or here, but because Christ is in you and you are connected and you say, please come in me. I want, I want you in me. I want to do whatever you say. I want to love you. I want to know you. I want to see your face. A day with you is better than a thousand days in Las Vegas. Please come in me. Come in me today. Come into my heart, Lord. But even if you are here, perfect, Paul, the apostle, and you separate from Christ, you will be lost, though you may be perfect, because not your perfection would give you heaven, but Christ's presence in you. Christ in you. The hope of glory. Therefore, salvation is a continual connection with God. And His power can change you, grow you, transform you, give you fruits, give you salvation. That's how you acquire salvation. And that's how God transforms your life. Not you, but Him in you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, so many times we forget to fix our eyes on you and fix our eyes on self, on people, on problems, on challenges, on... All type of things, the giants in Jericho, the walls of Jericho. We fix our eyes on so many impossibilities and, and things that we, crisis and what we should do, what we should talk, what we should plan. Those are good. But Father, please help us understand that our greatest need is to be filled with your presence, to build our house on the rock, to be in you and you in us. Please help us to daily invite your presence and desire your presence as the deer desires water. We pray this in Jesus' name and thank you. Amen.